uh, take a minute before Dave speaks to go over the slides. EpiPen, can you check and make sure you have your EpiPen? Because I have one, so that means somebody does not. And if it's you, please find me so I can give you your EpiPen.
Okay, everyone, we're ready to get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Chebshelowitz. I'm uh, one of the co-leads for the for the Beaverworks CubeSat course going on this summer. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Professor David Miller. Uh, Dave Miller is the Jerome C. Hunsaker Professor in the Department of Aero Astro here at MIT. He's also a distinguished visiting scientist at JPL and the former director of the Space Systems Laboratory here at MIT. He has a very long list of space activities that he's been involved with. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, including James Webb Space Telescope. He's got, uh, uh, well, the, uh, big big badge that he has is uh, he just spent two years as the uh, NASA's chief te technologist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, he does a lot of research in controls and dynamics in, in space and uh, has a couple of experiments, including the, the ISS Spheres Lab, which you can see really cool videos online. We'll see him today. And we'll see him today. Uh, Professor Miller also was uh, instrumental in developing the uh, project-based learning here at MIT that a lot of the undergrads go through, including myself. I was actually a student in 2005 in Professor Miller's class where he taught me. Uh, it was the Moretta uh, Modular Reconfigurable Mars Rover, uh, which we brought to a, about a PDR level and pitched. Uh, you can see in CSAIL. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's still a model of it uh, somewhere here on campus. Did you get an <laughs> I, did, I did well enough. I work at MIT now, right? One of your classmates just became an astronaut. Uh, Jasmine, yeah. No. yeah. But she, she was a Marine's uh, fighter pilot for a while, which, which helps a little bit, you know? <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> I'm here uh, doing more engineering at Lincoln Laboratory. Uh, which is also very exciting. Um, uh, right, and right now, I guess you're the, the PI for the Rexus imager on the OSIRIS-REx uh, mission, sort of. <laughs> but without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor David Miller. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear myself. OK. Uh, what is special about today? It's Friday, yeah, more special than that. 49th anniversary of landing on the moon. So let me ask you another question. Where were you that day? <laughs> let me ask Dr. Shin. Where were you that day? <laughs> oh, you don't know. Oh. Am I the only one that saw it? I was in Seoul, Korea. Oh, OK. Yeah, nice. Okay, so next year's a big year for some reason, and uh, Base 10 system, 50 is a big deal, so uh, 50th anniversary, so uh, that's exciting. Uh, a handful of the moon rockers actually graduated with their master's degree from Aero Astro because they came up to MIT to learn how to build the guidance system for Apollo. And uh, there was a professor, Dick Batten, who had signed the theses of three people that have walked on the moon. So with my many grad students, I'm only three behind him and catching up fast. So it's, uh, it'd be nice to get some more moonwalkers out there in the near future. So what I'm going to talk about today is this sort of a, there's sort of a nuance in the sentence. If you can't create space in your lab, create your lab in space. So when I talk about space, I don't mean room. I mean outer space. So what makes outer space unique to what we see here? Uh, vacuum. vacuum? Knowledge, it extends infinitely. Okay, I'll get back to, well, so I call that one the, the big view. Just a trip, nope, there's no bigger sp sky than what you got in space, so. There are too many variables. There's what? There are too many variables. Too many variables. Huh, I haven't thought about that. Oh, okay, we'll put that over in the list I hadn't thought about. <laughs> there's, this is going to get long anymore in one hand. Go ahead. Less gravitational influence and also more complicated Right. So I'm going to put that at orbital dynamics, that just brief, just as a high level, and microgravity, weightlessness. Okay. I'll call that radiation, though a piece of space junk might be an odd thing to call radiation, but radiation. If anything goes 
<laughs> yeah, well, you know, I wonder if, uh, you know, the field of autonomy really started back in the Mariner missions in the early 60s, that, you know, these machines had to sort of think for themselves because there was no way to do anything. But uh, I'll add one more. Well, go ahead. Well, there's, um, let me put that into the radiation category because I only got so many fingers here. <laughs> so the last one I'll add is, um, is extremes of temperature. So we can test on the ground temperature, radiation, vacuum, but what we cannot test on the ground is microgravity, uh, orbital dynamics, or the big view. So what I mean is... I thought there's this thing where you have to fly up and you go down. Yes. Yeah, and then, and then you lose your lunch, and always do it in the morning before, before lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can get uh, 30 seconds. It's a little, it's not quite pristine and everything, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. But if you want long duration microgravity, sort of on the order of minutes to hours to days to years, that kind of thing, because there's something about the system you're trying to test that requires that long and, and whose behavior changes when you remove gravity from the problem. So that's the thing that I'm really trying to do with my labs is create long duration microgravity lab uh, environment so that we can test things that you can't test on the ground. Okay. <clears throat> so Adam went through this, but I'll just say quickly, I grew up watching Gemini and that's not my TV set, but it looks like it. Watched the Apollo moon landing, went to MIT, uh, bought a hang glider. That's about as high I ever got off the ground. Scuffed my knees a lot on the right there. Then I got a glider, that was better. Then I got a power plane. Then I went to the Pentagon as an advisor to the secretary and the chief of staff. And then I went to NASA headquarters, and now I'm back. And it's nice to be back. So that's sort of a quick view of where I've sort of gone. So the nice thing about university is they let you get out and express your opinion in Washington, D.C., and then come home and, and you're protected. So that's, you feel welcome when you come back. So here's a little bit about my lab. <clears throat> Basically, I, I run the, uh, I help run the, uh, design build capstone class, which is the bottom right where we build things. And then up at the top is where my graduate students actually fly them in space. About a third of the projects that we work on have actually made it to space. And on the Moretta project, which was mentioned here, the vision system has actually made it. And I'll show you that. Uh, not the legged rover part yet, but uh, we're working on that. So I want to show this because I just think it's a beautiful piece of machinery. You're looking at about $5 billion there just in case you're wondering how much that costs. Anyone know what it is? What, what's the, do you know the specific telescope? James Webb, right. So you know Hubble, right? And that's two and a quarter meters in diameter, the primary mirror. This is a James Webb Space Telescope, six meters, over six meters in diameter. It's going to be cooled to 40 Kelvin. The whole telescope, not just the instruments at the, at the back end, but the whole telescope, actually those instruments will go down to single digits, Kelvin, but the, the whole primary mirror and secondary tower and secondary mirror be cooled to 40 degrees Kelvin. That's pretty extreme. There's other extreme things here. It has to be folded up. The rocket it's going in is a five meter diameter fairing. Uh, so they, that's six some meters in diameter. So you can sort of see it's made out of hexagons, big, big sort of hexagonal uh, segments, that has to be folded up. That's complicated. So as we move to the future, there's actually a number of space telescopes, I mean, scientists or astrophysicists just never have enough. They want to get up to 20 meters in size and beyond. And at some point, you can't fit it in the telescope anymore. You can't even fold it up into the, into the launch vehicle anymore. So one of the areas that uh, NASA Astrophysics is taking a serious look at is how could we assemble or manufacture in space some of these elements. And uh, that's a theme I'm gonna carry through my talk. So thinking about, keep this picture in mind, and I'm gonna show you how the laboratories we have on the ground and in space are sort of working on the pieces of doing robotic assembly of things that are bigger than that. So you just saw James Webb Space Telescope. So here's a crazy idea. I showed this at a recent workshop uh, on in space robotic assembly of space telescopes. And, and it was the only time I ever see, uh, saw a bunch of astronomers sort of lost for words. But the idea here is, could you actually put this whole thing together and maintain its shape electromagnetically? Silence. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> so the idea, you can see the secondary mirror out to the right there. There's no more tower. You don't have to deploy the tower. The tower's not in the line of sight and diffracting the light coming in from the object you're looking at. 
You could actually trap all those mirrors magnetically, those segment mirrors. You could separate the, uh, the sunshade, which is that sort of fanned out gray region. You could separate that physically, mechanically from the telescope. So all the vibrations in the spacecraft on the bottom don't feed in, in and shake the telescope. So theoretically, you could do this. And there are a bunch of advantages, of course. There's also a bunch of disadvantages and complexities you got to work on. So that's the idea is how do, can we work on those and get those to be mature? There's something called technology readiness level. Can you mature it and show it in a space environment so that you can convince the people that have the money that this is going to work and they'll, they'll then spend the money? So I'm going to show you pieces about you know, how would we magnetically control things, how would we maneuver around, how would we get a situational awareness of our construction site, how do we dock things and mate them together. You'll see a bunch of things through the, uh, through the movies I'm about to show you from Space Station. But first I'm going to start on the ground because I still got you wondering about this electromagnetic stuff, I can tell. So what we did in a capstone class that might have preceded yours was something called EMFF, Electromagnetic Formation Flight. So everyone knows what acronyms are? So I call it a dacronym because it has, it has meaning as an acronym. The letters are the first letters of important words that describe the project. But the, but the acronym actually makes a word in itself, so it's a double acronym. So I say oomph. So it's a way to create oomph or, or mobility or change momentum without the use of propellant because when, pro when propellant runs out, tanks are dry, we don't have gas stations in space yet. So then you gotta throw away the car. And uh, so this is the idea of using electromagnetics that control relative motion between vehicles. So those silver rings there contain high temperature superconductor. So high temperature means liquid nitrogen, 70 Kelvin. And uh, so 70 Kelvin is very plentiful on James Webb. Actually, it's 40 Kelvin. So you could think of using high temperature superconductors on these big infrared telescopes. And basically, they create a magnetic dipole. You've played with magnets. They can attract, they can repel, but they can also do other things. And I'll show you that here. So animations make things look easy. So I'm going to start with an animation big dramatic role in here. but uh, So the nice thing about these high temperature super, superconductors is you can put, we put 100 amps through it. You have an appreciation for amps? 100 amps is a lot. Through four D cell rechargeable batteries for an hour. Unbelievable. So you start with two satellites, you go out, you separate them, you deploy the solar panels, all that mundane stuff. This is actually fast and how how these things actually operate in space. You could have one up to three rings or more if you wanted. And uh, so you deploy those rings and they contain this high temperature superconductor. And if you're an infrared telescope, you can keep them cold for free, or at least the telescope's providing that. Uh, if you're not, there are ways that you can use cryogenic heat pipes and fancy things like that to keep it cold, that adds some more complication. But if you put a current through one of the rings, like the equatorial ring, you'll create a magnetic dipole with a north and a south in that vertical direction. But now you can slew it around by changing which coil has the current, right? Easy enough. Don't worry about how all this magnetic field hurts all the other onboard stuff. That's Dr. Shin's stuff to worry about. <laughs> Ask him. So you can do the obvious things like you do with fridge magnets. You know, they can attract. You don't want to get that close. They can repel. But one thing that I sort of hadn't realized when I started this project is they can shear. So if you put them perpendicular, those fields, they'll do that. But conservation of angle momentum, am I going too far here? Maybe. OK, well, they had the spin as well when they did that. So if you don't want your satellite to spin while it's trying to shear relative to the other one, you use a reaction wheel, which is just a flywheel. And you torque on that flywheel and, and hold the thing steady, hold the satellite steady. So that's the trick. OK, so that's all you need to know about electromagnetics. So we built this, as we do in our capstone class. And I'm going to have a lot of movies, whoever's working the lighting. So. Uh, so here they are, and they're boiling. You can see the liquid nitrogen boiling off. That's how there's a, there's a can at the bottom there, a tank. We fill that with liquid nitrogen. Goes up, boils off. Uh, we've developed ways to electrically keep it cold. 
so you don't have to use this sort of boil off liquid nitrogen. But here he pushes it towards the other one in the background, which has 100 amps and it's face on coil, and he repels. And when it starts going away, he can turn the current, current around and it, and it slows down and stops. So it works in 2D, but I'll tell you, when you get to three dimensions, it gets really complicated. I'll show you it not working in 3D. <laughs> There's another trick. Do you know what a transformer is? Oh, you know what a transformer is? It's sort of two coils all sort of meshed together. These are coils, though they're not meshed together. Here, here's pushing it sideways. So this is that idea of shearing. And there's a reaction wheel on it that's absorbing uh, some of the torque and trying to keep it steady. You can also do power transfer between them, because that's what a transformer does. It does power transfer between two coils. So you could beam power to your neighboring satellite, if you so choose to. So let me, uh, that sort of gives you, creates a lot of torque. That's really nice. So what could you do with this? So you remember James Webb, especially that electromagnetic one version of it. Um, so can we build a telescope? Well, let's take a look. Animation, you're gonna, it's, it's gonna say yes, you can. <laughs> so first thing you do is you buy a rocket, you paint your name on the side of it, and, uh, and then, uh, then you go to space. So James Webb, if you've ever seen the pictures, it has to fold up in a very, it's sort of like a, like a dining room table, which on the holidays you open up the leaves and put more tables or put more chairs around it. But here, if you're gonna robotically assemble, meaning all the pieces are actually physically disconnected uh, during launch, you could stack them like dishes in a cabinet, in the kitchen cabinet, which is a lot more sort of efficient in terms of packing efficiency in the launch vehicle. So here's one of my electromagnetic vehicles. There's another one at the top of the stack, so it is pushing against that. So as it maneuvers around, it's not spraying propellant around, which is gonna, which is gonna deposit on the mirrors and gum up the, the uh, telescope, so it's nice and pristine. You come in, you dock, so you need docking ports, some way to grapple another, another object. Now, unlike your kitchen, I don't think you usually pull the bottom dish out of the cabinet first. You know, that's, that's tricky, that's a 1G effect. In zero G, you have a lot more options. Uh, and now it's torquing, there's the second vehicle, so it's maneuvering. We can control all the relative motion between those two vehicles. So we place the first one. We then go back and get a second one. And over time, you can put this together. A couple things you'll see here is, first of all, we're assembling a mirror that's flat, which is not good for a telescope. <laughs> that pushes the secondary way out. But uh, those are just minor issues. But uh, the, so we can do, all of this is close proximity. Magnets don't work far apart, but when you're in close, they work pretty well. So uh, it could keep doing this forever uh, if you wanted to. It could be your little robot server or repair vehicle up on, up on the satellite. And uh, even more interesting is it could be, it could, the last thing it does is it goes and gets the secondary mirror and goes flies and holds it out in front, just like you saw in that earlier image. Uh, we can go grab the secondary here, fly it out in front of the, uh, of the primary, and now we get rid of all that uh, deployment tower and all the optical effects, degradation that it, that it creates, and that has a big advantage. Of course, I've got these big solar panels out in the way, but we're gonna take care of that in a moment after we eject this sort of assembly truss. The animator here really liked this sort of slow buildup, so I need to speed this up a bit. But uh, so there's the secondary, looking down at Earth, looking for exoplanets, whatever. People know what exoplanets are? When I was a kid, we had nine planets. Then we went down to eight. And now we've got 4,700 and whatever time it is today. Uh, the most recent exoplanet hunter was launched a few months ago was built here on MIT and at Lincoln Laboratory uh, called TESS for transit, transiting exoplanet survey satellite. And instead of like Kepler satellite, which sort of looks through a soda straw in a small part of the sky and saw thousands of planets, exoplanets, this is doing an all-sky survey. So it's, uh, the textbooks are being rewritten, the astronomy textbooks are being rewritten on an hourly basis these days. It's very exciting. All right, so keep that in mind. How do we, how do, we do all that stuff in the animation in real life? So what I've been doing over the last three decades is building laboratories in space. And there's really three main laboratories that we've worked up. The first one's on the left, which is called MODE. We were the, for mid-deck zero gravity dynamics experiment. 
That flew in the shuttle on the mid-deck. The mid-deck up to that time had been used for eating and sleeping and socializing among the astronauts. We were the first ones to come in and use it as a research laboratory. Uh, the uh, second, and that did three different flights, two on the shuttle and then it went up to the Mir space station. Anyone heard of Mir? Okay, where were you when Mir was re-entered? Maybe, <laughs> okay. So it was, um, it was a Russian space station and before we built the International Space Station, we had a program with them to go have the shuttle dock with Mir and do experiments and we were one of the experiments that, that flew up there. So then we moved on to another facility on the right, which is called MACE for Mid-Deck Active Control Experiment. Everyone know what controls are? If you're doing robotic cars or attitude control of satellites. So here we were adding a lot of um, uh, control algorithms to it and uh, we flew that on the shuttle and then it was the first experiment on the International Space Station. So thank you taxpayers for funding the space station so we could put our facility up there. But that's Bill Shepard, who's a graduate of MIT in the lower right there. Uh, he was the first commander or US commander of space station and uh, that's our hardware sort of dangling over his head there. Or depending on your orientation in space, maybe it's underneath him and he's just upside down. So uh, I'll show you a little movie of Mace from the mid-deck of the shuttle. And uh, okay, we've got, oh, we have uh, sound. We've got a six minute video to show you here. We'll bring you back on the flight deck uh, that, for a little bit at the end of it. That's the commander. Let me. Um, hey, we're on the mid deck. And I'll show you just a little bit of the assembly. Let me just forward this to. Uh, so the first rule of satellite attitude control is to roll off the bandwidth of the of the control system at least a decade in frequency below the first flexible mode. Well, we got that wrong on this experiment. We did it at 10 times the first flexible mode. We wanted to show that you could model the flexibility accurately enough, there's flexible modes, it's like a flapping contraption, that you could model it accurately enough on the ground and through modeling that when you get up into space, you could actually close very high performing high gain control loops, even though the dynamics were really complex. And uh, so let me get this going again. Now you also want to remember this is a laboratory. Key thing about a laboratory is you want to see things work, but you also want to know when they're going to break. In a control system, it breaks when it goes unstable. When it goes unstable to next to the, the shuttle commander's head, that is a safety concern. So it's a bunch of fun things to work on, but I'll show you this thing going, working well and working poorly. And you learn a lot from what fails. A, a scanning device at one end and a pointing device requiring great accuracy at the other end. Here we're starting a, a run. Let me run this a little further. There's a little laser pen to help you visualize what's going on. So that we can demonstrate for you just how uh, remarkable. People are sleeping behind those little, uh, little panels there. Here the disturbance has gone in, and you can see the laser spot against the uh, sleep station. And the control goes in right there. And so when you move the bandwidth the, way up higher, you get a much finer pointing. You just got to know what all these dynamics are and get them right. Not every single controller works this way. Some of them uh, perform, and, and I can say the vast majority of them uh, perform very well and got better as the flight went along. See that high frequency so dither on the wall? That's a, that's a control system gone bad. And this was a geometry we could never test on the ground. It would just break itself on the ground. It's too heavy. This one's more exciting. Proving to NASA that this won't break or hurt anyone is a fun trick. That's a whole nother five-day story to tell, so <laughs> I, won't, I won't make you suffer through that. We then made it up on the space station, and uh, here, here we started working on things like neural networks, and also on, uh, so this is it training its network. That's not very exciting, but that's Susan Helms in the back, which is the second US astronaut on space station. Uh, and then this is her talking about it in, in the, the IMAX movie on station. Susan entertained herself on the weekend. Here we're doing gain yeah, scheduling, really which is another form. This experiment. It was like playing with a big toy. It had moving big parts toy. and a brain. When you launch a satellite into space, 
the control system is the designer's best guess of how it should control its own sensors and appendages. This experiment was trying to understand how you could design a control system to teach itself to work better. So there are several satellites that have been flown subsequent to this that use the, uh, these techniques that we showed on, on MACE. And those, those flights on station were in 2000, 2001. So the third facility we built is called Spheres. Uh, that's the one that's still going on. It's basically these little satellites that fly inside the International Space Station. And uh, the reason we do that, again, the reason we act we operate indoors is when the technology breaks, we don't lose the satellite, we don't hurt anyone, we don't hurt the vehicle and all that. So uh, if you've ever seen Star Wars, I was there on opening day in 1977. So it's the first movie, but it's the fourth in the series? Whatever, you know, the, okay, thanks. Uh, when Luke Skywalker gets up on the Millennium Falcon, he gets, what's that? Oops, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're in trouble for that. The, um, he, learns how to, he learns how to channel the force by that little floating droid that's zapping him. Anyone remember that? Yeah. yeah. Actually, um, Lucas Films contacted us because we're one of the few instantiations in real life of something that happened in Star Wars. And uh, so the, um, yeah. I was about to say Star Wars is not real, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you that spoiler alert either. But, but one of the key things is in the center there, there's this little bracket. It's a D-shell connector and on a little protoboard. I, my, my students and my re really were angry the day I came in. We had finished doing our whole design. We're building the flight hardware. And I said, I have one more change. And they're like, you're, you're breaking your own rules here. And I said, I wanted this little plug on the back because I don't know what we might want to plug on. So we did that, put a little plate over it, launched these up the station. In the upper left, we do formation flight kind of stuff, kind of like how aircraft do, but we do it with spacecraft. Uh, but then we wanted to add fluid tanks, lower left. So we needed to use that plug so that we can see how fluid behaves in zero gravity. Fluid behaves very differently in zero gravity. And when, it is your, when it's your coffee cup, it could be annoying, but when it's your propellant tank with fluid in it, it could mean the end of your mission if you don't know where that fluid is. Uh, at the top center, we gave it eyes. Anyone know Wally the robot? Sort of, sort of looks like Wally. I've been wanting to get a picture of it looking out through the cupola back to Earth. Wally wants to go home kind of thing, but uh, we haven't been able to get that done. Upper right is electromagnetics. Lower right, so remember I talked about the telescope assembly with electromagnetics. Lower right are docking ports, again, assembly. And then the center bottom is like a bat belt from Batman. It's a, uh, it's a way to put a bunch of different things around a sphere like cameras and, and robotic arms and docking ports and stuff like that so that these could be sort of the, the, the base for building a larger system for doing robotic assembly. So that little expansion port, I was justified a decade later for doing that. So, so let me show you some movies from Station. One of the cool things here is, um, is well, who wants to be an astronaut? Come on, somebody, there we go. So while uh, ma astronauts work for us, so once you become an astronaut, you're gonna find out you can't get rid of MIT. <laughs> so uh, some of the things you might wanna do when you're doing uh, close operation between satellites, you might wanna avoid collision. So here's a nice movie where we command, this I think is in the US laboratory. More recently, we've been operating in the Japanese module, but we command the satellites to go to their corners and then try to run through each other and they autonomously identify that they're about to collide, so they plan a trajectory so that they can successfully complete the, complete the maneuver without colliding. And you know, in zero gravity, you got a third dimension, so you can, you can take advantage of that. Uh, some other things you might wanna do is you might have launched some of your satellites early and uh, you launch some others later and you might wanna get them into an array. So in the upper right, the blue one is talking to the others. They have Wi-Fi, they have propulsion, they have a whole bunch of things on board each satellite. And so how can you very efficiently uh, jump in? You notice the uh, operator there is wearing an MIT shirt, another graduate. I think we lead, for civilian schools, we lead the number of, there are more astronauts from MIT than at least for the Western space program than anywhere else. So there's another hint. 
And then uh, we wanted to do like uh, docking with tumbling objects. So let's say you got space debris. You've heard about this problem we need to clean up. Then this space debris is tumbling. So the blue one there is gonna tumble and the red one's coming in and it's, they're communicating, it's telling it about the tumble so it can come in and land on it, softly land, stop the tumble, and then dispose of the debris. One thing I'm proud to say is station really likes to avoid collisions and we have more collisions with space station than anyone else. It's just all from the inside, inside the belly of the beast. So uh, the nice thing is when they collide, we hit the reset button and go again. So, so here uh, with the vision, we've added uh, inspection. So, you know, as you fly around and you can image something that's, let's say, tumbling like space debris, what can you learn about, about that, that tumble that could be useful to you? So here's a case where we're doing dual inspection. So two of these satellites, this one and over here, this one, have stereo cameras and they'll actually strobe in order to illuminate the tumbling object, which is this guy with these sort of weird sticker pattern on it. And um, we speed these up. Uh, astronaut Gerst is not, um, not quite that uh, caffeined up here. So, uh, but here we're doing a dual inspection kind of maneuver and we're characterizing the, uh, the tumble of that object. And so it's not just a, that tumble is not just a flat spin sort of going around one axis, it's actually nutating. So if you played with gyroscope spinning tops, you know, there's sort of a wobble as it spins. So can you characterize all that? And the answer is yes. This is just some details about what the stereo camera does and all that. But, uh, so here's a word of the day, pole hoed. Anyone heard of that word before? Sirtash has. <laughs> so the pole hode is the trajectory that a nutating, the angular velocity vector of a nutating body will follow. So when I sort of said you're spinning, but you're also nutating, you're kind of wobbling, it's, it's that motion, it's that trajectory of the, of the, of the spin axis that uh, you're trying to identify. And here visually, we were able to identify that quite well. We're building a point cloud map of the system, but over in the bottom right, is where we're identifying the pole hode and the principal axes of inertia as well as the inertia ratios of the body. And all that boils down to saying that with a very noisy sensor, we're able to predict, we're able to develop a model that predicts the motion of that tumbling object well into the future. Which means now we know it very well at spin, so if we wanna go in and land on a tumbling object, like space debris, we can do that very reliably. All right. So I was gonna show you some of the recent work we're doing, uh, but before I do that, this person right here is Peggy Whitson. What's special about Peggy Whitson? Isn't she, she does have a record like that. I don't think it's consecutive. Um, one of the twins, for, well it's for US astronauts, she has the most time on orbit period. And uh, there was the one year mission, uh, what are the two brothers' names, the twins? They did that uh, study, Skelly, Kelly, right. Uh, he was about a year, they round up to a year, it's 340 days or something like that. But he might have the most consecutive, but she has the most time on orbit, period. So luckily, it's a privilege to get her time to operate your experiment, but it's also, um, it's not surprising because she's always up there. So, it's, uh, so here she was checking out the... Um, the uh, They're getting to work with the leaders in the aerospace industry on real hardware. State of the art that technology with something education is something we really need to marry. And Sorry, that's a soundtrack from something completely different. But uh, here are those sort of tool belts that she was working on to make sure that it was a checkout phase where we wanted to make sure that they work properly. Here we're doing the electromagnetics. So you can sort of, you can see the motion of that second ring. The first one's sort of strapped to the station, but the second one, that's, that's what happens when electromagnetics goes bad. But um, we were able to do power transfer, we were able to do some, some relative motion control and things like that. And doing it in three dimensions just adds to the complexity of the problem. 
We also did fluid slosh. Now you can't really, you can't see the fluid in this because we're using the, the camera system to image the, the fluid surface, but it's in that yellow section. So we can take it through large slew maneuvers. And the data we got out of this experiment was used to, um, to upgrade the models for our, for our um, for expendable launch fleet, basically the Atlas and the Delta IV, because when they, they spin the upper stage for stabilization as they fire the upper stage, but fluid slosh was causing them to prematurely deplete their stabilization propellant as it starts wobbling, nutating. And so these models were used to upgrade, upgrade how we operate the uh, upper stages of the Delta IV and the Atlas. I uh, talked about docking, another necessary thing for uh, assembly. So here we're actually starting docked, and they're wrestling with each other. It's like two dogs with a bone. But they're, they're identifying what their combined inertia properties and sensor geometry and so forth. And uh, so that as you assemble pieces together of a telescope, its dynamics are going to change. And you need to identify that as you go along. So one of the last things I want to talk about today is um, one of the astronauts, you remember him probably before with the little MIT shirt on. He came down from that mission. He came and visited us. We handed him a sphere to hold so that uh, we get a photo. And he said, wow, that's heavy. <laughs> he had never felt how its, its weight. He'd only felt its mass. And so, but he said, you know, you seem to have designed this so that you can't hurt anything. And we said, yes. And even if the technology breaks, Nothing mechanically or physically breaks. So, so he said, so anyone could program them. We said, yes. Where are you going with this? So he's, he said, so high school kids could program them. We said, yes, they could. So we created nine, 10 years ago an activity. Called, who's heard of FIRST Robotics? Yeah. yeah, OK. Now, I'm not going to see as many hands here. Who's heard of Zero Robotics? A few, OK. So we are in the ninth or tenth season of Zero Robotics. So it's, a robo it's the only robotics competition it's, that is run off the planet, or is out of this world, or whatever sort of kitschy thing you want to call it. Uh, have you heard of the new game, Deep Space? <laughs> robotics. Oh, shoot. What's that? This, this is a new oh, so how do they, how do, they do theirs? Uh, they, they haven't released any yeah, yeah. Oh, so they're copying us, huh? So it's their theme, but, but do they actually, do you program robots that are in space? No. Why not? I'm hearing too many things. Uh, so what we do is we created zero robotics. The zero, I wanted to be one, one ahead of first, so that's why we went with zero. Uh, the other thing is it's zero cost. So you don't have to buy anything. It's all set up. You just got to have an internet connection. Um, and it's um, zero gravity. So we started off back in 2009 with two schools up in the northern part of Idaho. That's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, we can go over that in lunch or whatever. But over the years, we've grown this. We've added Europe in. We first grew it across the United States. This is a high school program. It happens in the fall. So at the end of August, we're going to have the kickoff. If you go to zerorobotics.mit.edu, you'll find all the information. The middle school program happens in the summer. Our finals are in on August 10th, pending scheduling changes from the International Space Station and NASA and all that. But usually, they keep that target very stable. Because what we do in the finals, we've actually held them in this room once. We have a live feed from Space Station where the astronauts are calling off the blow-by-blow blow of, the, of the competition. And you know, Glenn High School sitting over there, and the Avogadro School from Turin, Italy sitting over here. And they're screaming and yelling and crying and all that. And it's nice. We get this live feed. And you can see it in the upper right there. So over the years, we've expanded this. I think that point in the middle of the Atlantic is the Azores. So that was, that was great to see. Um, we. Uh, Let's see, we, we actually went south of the hemisphere. We got Australia in, we got Japan in, uh, Russia's plane. I'm not sure where that pin in the middle of Siberia is, but uh, 
Ah, uh, the internet, you know. <laughs> but uh, we are now uh, 26 countries across four continents, and uh, we're still pushing for Antarctica. That would be great. But uh, the um, it's it's really great to see. We can't we can't run all everyone's code on stations, so we do have a down select period, and after that we make teams collaborate, and so. Uh, you now we've created it that you have to collaborate with an international school or one that's not in the same country as you are. So that's, uh, that's a fun competition. So it's going to start again this, uh, this fall. Check it out, zerorobotics.mit.edu. Uh, this is a bit of an image. This is one image that you would see from uh, inside, that you'd see inside station. The game actually plays out on the computer there so the astronauts can see what's going on. Teams are competing head to head. There are a bunch of virtual objects in the scene. We're trying to get um, some film companies to help us sort of put those virtual objects in there so that you can see what they are. But there's a certain motion you have to go, like that twirl in order to pick up a repeller or an attractor or pick up uh, some, some precious mineral that you're trying to extract out of an asteroid and things like that. And so it's really an arena style competition that, that we run. So let me um, close out here. I just wanted to mention another thing. We do a lot of stuff on the International Space Station, but we also do other things. Professor Kerry Cahoy, there's a group of you working on CubeSats here. Yay, okay. So she's worked on some, with Lincoln Laboratory, a number of interesting uh, CubeSats. One's called Micromass. It's a dual spinning, the, basically the sensor head spins. Uh, another one that was, and that was started in the uh, capstone class that we run. Another one is ExoplanetSat, which to find, to look at nearby stars for planets that might be orbiting. That flew, uh, JPL um, hired my, my grad, uh, Sarah Seeger. If you've ever heard of Sarah Seeger, she's a MacArthur Genius Award winner. She's, she's a leader in characterizing exoplanet atmospheres. How the heck you do that? I have no idea. But uh, she's a leader in it. And we built this thing called ExoplanetSat. JPL liked it so much, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, heard of them. They hired my students, they took our experiment and they flew it, they renamed it, thinking they could get away with under the radar, nope. But it's called Asteria, it's been up for um, I think several months now and it's, it's sub arc second pointing accuracy which it's hard to understand how small that is but it's really small and it's really good and, uh, and looking for planets. And this is a uh, more recent one. Anyone heard of the OSIRIS-REx mission? Asteroid sample will return. It's, it's any day now. It's actually going to see asteroid Bennu in its rear view mirror. No, it's front view mirror. <laughs> and um, Bennu is the second most dangerous asteroid to Earth that we know about. And, uh, but you don't have to worry until about 2150 or so, but it's, a, it's an Earth-crossing asteroid. We're going out, it's carbonaceous chondrite, and we built that instrument, actually students in this capstone class, and then graduate students later with the help of Lincoln Laboratory and others built that instrument. It's, a, it's an X-ray telescope that um, you, it works in a very interesting way. The primary mirror is not what you would expect it is, but it's a very compact X-ray telescope. So we'll be able to find what are the various elements across the surface of Bennu to figure out where you want to take the sample. So with that, I think I'll stop and uh, take any questions. <laughs> questions, any questions? Oh, the, you mean the electromagnetic field, kind of how, how strong that is? Oh, so, so if you mechanically, so how could you power your telescope if you're not, if there are no wires going across these various interfaces and you're... Oh, okay. Um, so the way we would do that is on the, on the back side, Oh, I didn't want to do that. So the satellite is down, at the, the spacecraft bus is down on the bottom. The sun would be down in this picture. So we'd have solar rays on that bottom layer. 
and then we would use the solar rays to create electricity, store it in batteries, whatever. And then through this inductive coupling, this sort of transformer effect, we could then beam power to the other pieces of the, uh, the to the primary mirror and to the secondary through this inductive coupling. Instead of having a, you know, an extension cord that runs across, that would make it, that would make it problematic. But beaming power is easy. But you know, it's yeah, th that's our way of thinking through that problem. So I've got two questions. The first one is uh, for your electromagnetic control experiments on sta space station. Uh, how much of a factor do you guys like? How much do you guys consider like the strong electromagnetic fields? affecting other like equipment on the ISS? So um, they didn't seem to be concerned, didn't make the news, so we didn't do any damage there. But on the telescope, there is concern. Uh, you don't like to have spacecraft that have uh, a net electro uh, magnetic dipole to it. So one of the things, it's not a very strong field. It, for torque, you, you basically, it's the cross product between the two magnetic moments that gives you torque. Uh, for force, that's the tough one because that rolls, um, it rolls off the strength, the force you can generate rolls off with distance to the fourth power. So that's why you gotta be somewhat close. But with the superconductors at 100 meters away between adjacent satellites, you can get about the same force as electric propulsion, sort of in the tens of millinewtons range. With regular copper coils, that comes down to a, to a few centimeters, so that's not very helpful. You know, just put a bolt and tie the two together. But um, the uh, so it ends up so for force, it's really the curvature of the field lines from the one vehicle through the coil of the other vehicle. So the reason you cannot make you cannot create any appreciable force against Earth's dipole, magnetic dipole, is because across the extent of a satellite, the field lines are parallel. So you're not. I mean, you'll get I don't know nano nano newtons or something or even less. But for us, because the torus, the, the field lines that come out of like a torus and then close on each other, there's appreciable sort of divergence through the other coil. And that's what creates the, the force. So it's not that it's strong, but it's still stronger than Earth's magnetic field. So I'm, I'm I learned this trick in Washington, DC. You don't answer the question you want to, that you're asked. You, ask the, you answer the one you want to answer. <laughs> but I'm getting to it. I'm sneaking up on it. So then there's a material called mu metal which is like a, it's like a magnetic equivalent to, um, to a Faraday cage or, and, and so about a couple millimeters of mu metal uh, put around your electronics or avionics, aviation electronics. You, you, um, you'll reduce the field that's outside the box down to Earth's magnetic field inside the box. And then the last piece to this question, to my answer is that you can't, you cannot put a camera inside a box. That sort of defeats the purpose. And so how do you deal with that? Because a lot of these cameras are sensitive magnetic fields. So, um, and I, find, I found out recently that this is something they, they whoever they are, uh, telescope builders do, is you put another small electromagnet right in the vicinity of the camera to, and, and to do a cancellation of the field locally around that. So I'm waving my hands, that's my answer to that. And yeah, it's something you have to think about is these, these, these fields, yeah. Oh, How do you propel the, the spheres within the ISS? Uh, so there's 12 thrusters, and they're cold gas. We use liquid CO2, which seems odd because CO2 is an asphyxiant in a closed environment. And, um, and we use a uh, little solenoid, so it's a pulse width modulated control system. We put a certain amount of force, and you can hold the valves open for a certain amount of time, so the integral under force over time is impulse. So we can change the impulse, we just can't change the force. And there's 12 of them, and they're, they're sort of lined up in different pairs. Yeah. Um, any other? Uh, how do you get away with using CO2 in this <laughs> I opened myself up, didn't I? Um, how do you get it carefully? Uh, so, so this was the logic. There were some that were proposing, why don't we put up fans, and actually some if you've been watching Space News recently, the Japanese have put up a free flyer, the Europeans have put up a free flyer inside station, uh, and NASA's about to put up a, few, a couple free flyers on station, I think three of them. Um, we've been up for 12 years. The, um, so at the time, fans are good because you've got air, you can push that around. It's not really realistic from a satellite point of view, 
but you, um, you need to recharge, you need rechargeable batteries. We, they were deemed dangerous, rechargeables, so we weren't allowed to do that. So what we did was we figured out what's the energy content in a tank of liquid CO2 compared to what you get in a one-use disposable battery, and it was higher. So we said, instead of using batteries to run the whole thing, we'll just use batteries for the electronics, and we'll use CO2 tanks. Now, we could have gone with, with compressed nitrogen, which is not an asphyxiant, or compressed air, like scuba divers, but any scuba divers here, you know, those tanks are heavy. And if you look at the rocket equation, anyone look at the rocket equation here? Okay, one person. <laughs> um, the rocket equation, and uh, created by Konstantin Silkovsky in the wilds of Siberia, figured out how much propellant it, need, it takes to move a satellite around and the propellant that, that you're going to use later. So it's sort of a compound interest equation that says uh, the mass of propellant grows exponentially the, the faster you want to go. And so, and it's all a function of the mass of the thing you're trying to move. So a scuba tank's very heavy. So we found liquid nitrogen is like at a double point or a triple point at room temperature. Do you remember your phase? Whatever. OK. Um, so it's liquid at very low pressure compared to a scuba tank. Scuba tank's 2,500 PSI. This is only 860 PSI. So it's safer. And then it's a little less ISP. I, if you know what ISP is, great. Otherwise, ask me later. Uh, and, if you, um, and the other thing is we change tanks. So, um, so it's like a staged rocket. So we can be, we can be very efficient in how we use an inefficient gas. And it's about the same amount of CO2 released as an extra astronaut breathing. So we went with it. <laughs> uh, now we can use rechargeables, and that sort of changes the game. But. So with the electromagnetic propulsion system, uh, won't you essentially create a, like a large amount of uh, sort of counterforce that pushes the overall system sort of like affect the uh, sort of the trajectory of the overall system? So sort of. So um, if you had these two satellites in low Earth orbit, well, we're in station, we're in low Earth orbit, but um, we aren't going to create much. It, they're internal forces and torques. So if you just have internal forces and torques between these two vehicles, you cannot change the, the velocity or the rotation rate of the center of mass of the system. However, in Earth, Earth has a magnetic field, which is going to couple in. So that's an external torque. The force is very minimal from Earth's field because the field lines are straight. But the torque is significant. So if you ignore that torque, you do that at your peril. <laughs> Things start tumbling around. Um, but if you know about it, you can use it very effectively. Satellites use torque against Earth's magnetic field to control satellites. So they put in big coils or torque rods or whatever. And uh, so if you, um, it's basically to dump angular momentum. Ask me at lunch. But um, uh, so you do have to consider that. There can be external torques that happen. If I've got 10 satellites, all with these coils on them, they're all coupling together. So figuring out how to move them, I have a great animation of that, but I didn't have the money to build 10, 10 of these things. Though. But uh, it's a really a coupled thing. We did a minimum, there's no minimum fuel answer because there's no fuel, but there's a minimum time trajectory of how to reorient 10 satellites and you would from point A to point B. And, uh, and it's not straight lines. You think minimum time is go straight, but actually they all squirrel around because they all have to have to interact their fields so they can get where they're going. And so it's uh, from a from a mathematician academic point of view, it's a wonderful optimization problem. From a NASA program manager perspective, it's a nightmare. So that's what we're trying to trying to get those two cultures to see eye to eye. Can you give more detail on how you characterized the, the, the arm? to such a degree that you were allowed to, that you could run your control loop so aggressively? Um, yeah, this is on the MACE experiment. So, um, so basically, there's a bunch of flexible modes. They're lightly damped, which means there's very little energy dissipation. So when you excite them, they grow to large amplitude. And uh, we needed to test that. We, we built a model on it. So if you've heard of CAD models, computer-aided design models, 
Uh, there are finite element models for, measure, for, for modeling structural structures, loads, and dynamics, and frequencies of flexible modes and things. So you can model all that. The thing is, it's got a lot of fidelity but no accuracy until you actually correlate it with some data. So what we did was we set up a ground test environment where we had to hang this thing from cables, so it had pendulum modes and all the, and sag, sag, it, it would sag in the gravity field. So now we had, a, had this test set up in our lab where we had data, but it was very different from on orbit because it was all coupled in with a gravity, uh, with, directly with gravity through sag and indirectly through these dynamics of suspension cables and stuff. So what we did was we went to the finite element model, which we use, which, where we added in all the gravity terms, correlated the two models, get them, get them to agree very well, and then we go in and remove the effects, the gravity effects from the, um, from the what we call the 1G model. And then we, but we know going from 1G to 0G, there are still things we don't know. And, and so we built a, based a model, basically a model uncertainty, an uncertainty model about our 0G model. And, um, and then for testing on orbit, we, we use that uncertainty model to develop robust control. Robust control means that, that it will still work well even if your model is not quite right. And so there's a whole myriad of robust control tools that you can probably find in MATLAB control toolbox now. <laughs> so um, that you can go in and try to do those. You can also do adaptive control so it'll learn as it's up there. So things like that. That's another one week of discussion. But that's, that's how we did it. Oh, those annoying questions. No, that's, that's a good question. It's, um, so we really haven't looked at that problem too much, but if you've got these particles coming in, so the, the coil is made up, it's sort of a, it's a rectangular cross-section ribbon of superconductor, so it's mostly aluminum. Aluminum is our insulator. That's an odd insulator. But, uh, and then if you split it open, it's some kind of um, ceramic material. And, um, and the thing is that ceramic material has a certain cross-sectional area. You know, if you slice through, it's very small, square millimeter or something. Um, and there's a, at a, there's a maximum amount of amperage density, or amps per square millimeter, that you can put through. And it'll, once you hit that level, uh, you can put super, in a superconducting way, you can no longer put any more amperage through. And that amperage density, that maximum amperage density goes up as temperature goes down. So that's an interesting trade. But the problem is if you've got radiation particles coming through, it can slice that cross section and, and make some voids. And it'll start slicing away at your superconductor. And so you can estimate how long it's gonna take and what's, what's your degradation over time, depending on the field. We haven't really done that. Um, make the cross section big. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so, but good, good question. Sound like a program, like a mission manager. Um, this is a bit more personal. You said in one of your earlier slides that aerospace was kind of the first choice to be Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Um, my, my mother had a strong influence. She's one of the founders of Society of Women Engineers. She, uh, she bought me my first motorcycle because she was tired of me riding on the back of hers. She, at the age of 16, she took me to the airport, said it was time for you to fly. My, uh, my dad, who's a lawyer, said it's time you learned how to pay for it. So that sort of put a little time delay into things. Uh, she, really wanted to be, she really wanted to be an astronaut and all that. She, she, um, I got into MIT and I was gonna go to do some other university interviews and things like that for college. And she said, you got into MIT, you're going Aero Astro. Why waste time on other interviews? So I said, okay, Ma. <laughs> so, so, it's, um, so what I meant by that is, is, is I work with an astronaut who, who's um, Jeff Hoffman. I don't know if you had a chance to meet him, but he's the one that fixed Hubble. And uh, uh, he said, ah, so this wasn't your choice. It was your mother's choice. And I say, yes. But as you can see, my, my, my hobbies, my interests, my career, it all follows aerospace. Uh, so that's what I meant about it, it's the passion, so. 
Sure. Have you yourself ever been space? In my mind, no. <laughs> no, I haven't. It, it, I, I would like to. Uh, I'm hoping, uh, hoping Blue Origin and uh, SpaceX really, really get this going so we can. I don't have uh, $100 million in my pocket to throw on a sort of a, a tourist ride, but uh, if they can get the price down, that would be great, but I haven't. But I've worked with a lot of people who have. And I can tell you some interesting stories if you're interested. So about radiation. So I've heard this from several astronauts. When you go through the South Atlantic anomaly, anyone know what the South Atlantic anomaly is, sort of? If you can explain what it is, that'd be great. But, but it's where the radiation field, uh, belts come down a little lower. If you wake up at night when the lights are down, you'll see flashes in your eyes. And what it is, it's radiation particles that are in the, uh, that it, you know, particles from the sun that got trapped in the radiation belts and have come through the metal hull of the station or the shuttle, came through your hull of your head, which is your cranium, and went through your eyes. So you're seeing radiation go through your head. And it's, uh, they said it's hard to go to sleep again because it sort of gets you thinking. But, uh, and when you go out to the moon and you're outside, or Mars, and you're outside of the Earth's radiation, it, you know, the, ma the magnetic field, it's even worse. Yep. Yep. yep, you still see it. Yeah, there's no way to block it. So, um, yeah, yeah, try to go to sleep. <laughs> Another cool one is, uh, so Jeff Hoffman, who I mentioned, he fixed Hubble, and he would say he would go out in the uh, payload bay, and they put all the expensive stuff, all the replacement optics and stuff in the floor of the payload bay, and they have these little handrails along the edge where the hinge line on the shuttle doors are, payload bay doors. And what you do is your legs are really powerful. They're, you know, they're not very useful in space. So what you do is you want to get those away from the, from the hardware. And so you do a handstand and you go along on these handrails. So the other thing for thermal control, you don't want the stuff in the bay look, see in the sun. So you keep it facing Earth as you're going along. And the third part of this story is that your mind is always trying to figure out which way is up. So here you have vision. Uh, you also have your inner ear that tells you which way is up. You feel the, the, the pressure on your feet. You know which way is up. In space, you don't have any of that. So as, he, as he's doing this handstand, he says it never happened to him, but I think that's just astronaut bravado. But he's doing this handstand thing. I'm doing the world's best handstand. And then your mind just sort of flips all of a sudden because it's searching for a, for a frame, for an orientation. And you realize you are hanging 250 miles above Earth, and it just sort of makes you grab that handrail a little tighter, you know, and it takes you a little moment of pause, and then you go, and then it flips again, you go, oh, I'm doing a handstand. So you move along, and then it flips again. So it can be disconcerting. The mind is a funny thing, and, and when you, because you don't have any of those cues, your brain actually separates those sensors in software. So when you come back from space after a long, after maybe a six month mission on, on station, there's a, there's a sign in the uh, astronaut office that says, don't shower alone. So it's, what it means is, um, is that if you go into the shower and you say, you know, I'm going to start at the top and I'm going to lather my, shampoo my head, and I'm going to close my eyes because it stings, you shut the only, visual, the only orientation cue you have. You've closed your eyes and you fall over and you can hurt yourself. So what you do is you sit on the bottom of the shower in a tub and you do that for about four days. And then you start kneeling, and you do that for a few more days. And it's about two weeks you, you have your, your stability back. You can actually keep balance with your eyes closed. But it takes a while. How long does that usually last for? You mean how long would you see the lights in your eye? Well, if you're in Earth orbit, low Earth orbit, 90 minutes, the South Atlantic anomaly repeats its, probably goes through there once a day or once every, something like that. But, uh, and it's probably for a short amount of time, you know, a couple minutes or something like that. But if you're outside Earth's magnetic field, it keeps going. Um, you know, it's, it's a continuous kind of thing. So, um, so if, if, you, if you've read about some of the um, Apollo uh, astronauts that went out to the moon, um, they did see lights outside the command module, they say, and some have attributed it to different things. My theory is the command module windows are rather small, like portholes, and there's lights inside, so it's an illuminated area. 
but when you want it, you always want to look out the window. So when you press your face up against a window, you're sort of blocking the light that's around you, and now you're, you're, you're getting a darker view, and you're seeing the radiation come through your head, and you're going to see lights. It's like fireworks. So, no, maybe not. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Yeah. I'm going to admit up front that I haven't looked at this problem very much. That we did do, and, and I don't, it's not beaming like, uh, like a laser. It's more inductive coupling, which I guess is not, it's a transfer of energy. It's not a, a beam necessary, which is nice because if the other coil is not coupled to you, you're not sort of have the certain phase and frequency of the oscillation of the, of the current, um, then you're not going to extract power out of it where at a laser, you beamed it out there, and if no one gets in with a solar cell in, in the way of that beam, you, you still lose energy, but no one picked it up. So it's a more efficient way of doing it. But um, I don't think I answered your question. Yeah, how do you send it to multiple? I mean, you could have a mothership that, like the gateway that NASA wants to build out by the moon, and it, it's putting out a, it's got a big super magnetic coil, and then you could have these little exospheres that fly around that don't need their own power and don't need their own propellant. They're just flying around in their own sort of electromagnetic orbits around the station and getting powered, powered off, but I don't know. I'm waving my hands too much at this point. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so one of the problems that NASA, f one of the many problems NASA faces is, is that political decisions happen at a shorter time scale than we can actually fulfill the mission. And so it's moon, Mars, moon, Mars, moon, Mars. We keep flipping. And so one of the ideas is why don't we just get to the point where we're both become an option. And the lunar gateway is an idea to put us I don't want to call it a station. I'd rather call it the, the, trans, the interplanetary transit vehicle, where some people are seeing it as Space Station 2.0. But uh, to put it out by the moon, uh, not on the surface, but in a um, sort of near one of the Lagrange, well, that's not going to, if you know your Lagrange points. Anyone know your, your Lagrange points? OK, yeah. Okay. So ask me at lunch. But, um, that could be sort of your, your, your entrance point at your sort of your gas station at the entrance to the, to the interstate highway kind of thing, whether that highway heads down to the surface of the moon, heads to Mars or wherever else. It's a good staging point. And so a really cool thing about it is that from, for just a few handful of meters per second of velocity change, you can drop into a very elliptical orbit around Earth and then you launch the astronauts, you hook back in, and then you get a gravity assist from the moon for free. And uh, it's, it won't give you enough to get all the way to Mars, but any free change, increase in velocity is well worth it. So it's an interesting point from where you could get to the moon or you could get anywhere else in the solar system because you get some gravity assist off the moon. Um, is that, yeah. I think that's the last Where are you? Keeps us so long. Boy and one girl. We need 